Hi, I'm Janine Turner, founder of Constituting America. I and Kathy Gillespie, Constituting America's CEO, welcome you to our 13th annual 90-day study. 90 plus 90 equals 180. History holds the key to the future. We would like to thank Amanda Hughes for orchestrating these studies. Essay 5, First Principles of the American Founding, Today's principle, principle of classical history, discussed by the American founders for the purpose of applying its lessons toward a new and different governing system devoted to freedom and independence. Guest essayist, Winfield Rose. Christianity in the Roman Empire was first persecuted, then tolerated, and later adopted as the official religion. The latter development was to the long-term detriment to the faith because as the church adopted the structures and procedures of Roman imperial government, it became ever more corrupt, as had the Roman government itself during previous centuries. The details of this process are beyond the scope of this essay, but suffice it to say that at this point, that by 1517, a young German monk by the name of Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546, decided change was needed. He therefore wrote and tacked his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg and launched what came to be the Protestant Reformation, thereby fracturing Western Christianity forever. Professor Sue Davis correctly described this momentous event as follows. When Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the door of the castle church at Wittenberg in 1517, he initiated a revolution in politics as well as religion. The relevance of the Reformation to the American political system can be understood as follows. First, the Reformation divided a Europe that had followed one central faith for centuries into more than two distinct groups in that there was not one Protestant church faith denomination but four to be followed by more later. These four were the Lutherans, the Calvinists, the Anabaptists, and the Anglicans in England. These four groups not only differed from Catholicism, they differed from each other. It was therefore unfortunately inevitable that conflict would break out between them. On the continent, this took the form of the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, between German Catholics and Lutherans. There were religious civil wars in France between Catholics and Huguenots, French Calvinists. In England, it was the Puritan Revolution, English Civil War, 1640 to 1649, between Anglicans and those called Puritans who wanted to reform the Church of England along Calvinist lines. This resulted in the regicide of King Charles I and the establishment of the Prectorate of Oliver Cromwell in 1649. These wars had two significant impacts on what was to become the United States. First, Many Europeans tired of the seemingly endless slaughter and religious persecution and desired to escape, thereby immigrating to North America and populating the English colonies. Second, after flirting with bringing their sectarian conflicts with them, our forefathers decided to do otherwise, ultimately making religious freedom a part of the United States Constitution in the First Amendment. The American tradition of separation of church and state can be traced directly back to the conflicts spawned by the Protestant Reformation. In addition, the Protestant Reformation forced a fundamental change in political philosophy. The Magna Carta and Aquinas Treatise on Laws were minor tremors But the Reformation was a major earthquake in that it articulated a right of resistance to unjust authority. Romans 13 had been the basis of the governmental authority in both the church and state for centuries. 
Remember that Jamestown had been founded in 1607 and Plymouth in 1620, and that the King James translation of the Bible was published in 1611. The first seven verses of Roman 13 in that translation read as follows. 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. 4. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. 5. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. 6. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. 7. Render therefore to all their duties, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. These powerful words form the basis of the divine right of King's theory, and in part, the basis of the Pope's authority in the church. How could Luther resist the Pope and church without disobeying Romans 13? He could do so when he obeyed a higher authority God required him to. According to Luther, it is a sin to obey any authority that forces or tries to force people to do that which is ungodly, unjust, unrighteous, unlawful, or in other words, wrong. A godly person simply cannot do such things without sinning. About 150 years later, this became, quote, resistance to tyrants is obedience to God, end quote. The British government was violating God's law, and the Americans had not only the right, but the duty to resist. And they did. Winfield H. Rose, Ph.D., is Distinguished Professor of Political Science Emeritus at Murray State University. Thanks for joining us today. Tomorrow, or Monday, shall I say, will be a continuation of this essay. Have a wonderful weekend. And please don't forget to spread the word about this wonderful study and all of our other studies that are archived at constitutingamerica.org.